Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today on the CCDC2 2020 contract changes. My name is Andrew Cartwright, and I'm the Vice President of Surety at FCA Insurance Brokers, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Joining me is an esteemed panel of guests. From FCA, we have Jamie Collin, the Vice President of the Construction Practice. FCA is an 100-year-old privately owned insurance broker specializing in construction, insurance, and bonding. The construction team at FCA are regular presenters to a variety of construction associations and are regularly published in the Daily Commercial News. Joining us from Weirfolds LLP is Farron Bogach, partner, Krista Chater, partner, and Jess Gorgie, an associate. Weirfolds has clients for over 160 years. Their construction law team works as project lawyers. They are involved from start to finish, negotiating preparing agreements, and working closely with the project team to, to, to guide any type of construction project to successful completion. Before we begin, just a few rules of engagement. You'll notice on your screen there's a Q&A box. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please submit them there and we'll review at the end of the session. We will be getting a list of questions that weren't answered during the session uh, after the completion of the session and we'll make sure to reach out to individuals with the answers to those questions. With that, I'll pass it over to Jeff to start the presentation. Okay, thanks Andrew. So, and hi everyone, it's really great to see some of you uh, tuning in with us here today. So this is an overview of what we're gonna be covering. So um, we're gonna start with a short overview and refresher on the CCDC2 contract, how it's structured, when it's used, just to kind of orient everyone. Um, and we're gonna dive right into a discussion about the key changes that have been made to the new CCDC2 2020 version that was just released a few months ago. And uh, really, we're gonna look at what the implications of some of those changes are. So we'll come cover some of the key areas that were changed, like payment terms, this uh, new important concept of ready for takeover. And we'll also talk about the new insurance requirements for the CCDC contracts and the impl implication of those as well. And then we'll briefly talk about the new standard form division general requirements specification which CCDC also recently released alongside the new CCDC2 2020. Um, we'll have a discussion on supplementary conditions and the, what the implications are for the use of supplementary conditions as a result of the new CCDC2 2020. And then we'll briefly finish off talking about some of the uh, common mistakes we see get made um, when reviewing and negotiating and assembling CCDC contracts, as well as some fairly simple contract best practices. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Krista, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, while we'd rather be in person, we're glad we uh, can get to do this. So um, nice to have you all here. 106, it looks like. Um, okay, so um, just a recap on what the CCDC2 um, is for, which projects or, or which uh, contractual relationships rather it's for. Um, and it's for this traditional project structure. So the traditional structure where you have an owner, the owner um, addresses its own um, consultant needs um, directly with the contract with the consultant. We've listed there a, a number of different uh, documents, standard form documents that um, uh, perhaps the owner and the consultant may enter into. And then the CCDC2 then is the um, stipulated um, fixed price um, contract that the owner enters into with the contractor itself. So that's what the, the CCDC2 governs. And how is it structured? How is the CCDC two structured as a as a contract? Um, there's there's three parts to it. Farron, maybe if you go forward one slide. Here we go. Awesome, thank you. Um, the document, the CCDC itself, has sort of three parts. There's the agreement part, the definitions part, and the general conditions part. And these are the parts that are in the standard form, of course. Many times um, the parties will have supplementary conditions. Those are um, specific to the project or specific to the parties. Um, the standard form has these three parts. So the agreement part, that's what I call the A pages. That's the part where you fill in um, the parties, where the project is, um, 
uh, things like that. It's the part where people sign and there are all those pages that are named A um, at the beginning of the agreement. And we have a list there in the first block of the types of things you find there most importantly, or maybe not most importantly, I think it's most importantly, the price. That's where it gets filled in. Um, it is a stipulated price contract and that's where you'll find that price. So it's a standard form, the agreement piece, but it's the part of the standard form that has blanks in it, that you fill in um, the blanks for the information specific to the project. The other two parts, the definitions and the general conditions, they don't have blanks. You fill in any parts of them. They are the actual standard standard part of the standard form. Um, so the definitions part, um, it's really important, actually, um, not that we're doing uh, a whole presentation on CCDC2, but it's important um, to keep in mind the definitions part because um, when you get into the general conditions, you'll see certain um, words, phrases that are in italics and the general conditions. That's a signal to you to go back and make sure that word means what you think it means. Um, and you'll get that information from the definitions um, part. It has the definitions of all the essential terms. Um, and those definitions apply to all the contract documents. Just one more um, thing to keep in mind, if you're adding supplement conditions, make sure they the definitions actually match the definitions um, in the agreement. And then there's the general conditions. This is the guts of the agreement. This is where you have all these issues like the, the contract administration, the execution, payment, how default notices work, insurance, Jamie will talk about that, indemnifications, things like that. Um, and the general conditions are the part that then gets amended supplementary conditions. Um, they're the parts that have all the all the numbers, 1.1, 1.3, that sort of thing. Um, so that's how the document looks, just as a refresher. Um, so you remember what we're dealing with. Um, and now I will uh, turn over so we can discuss actual parts of the agreement and uh, the changes. Farron, take it away. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the CCDC2 2020 changes the payment terms. Um, the CCD suite of contracts is Canada-wide, but it now, um, it's sort of been updated to deal with, you know, prompt payment as it's here in Ontario and coming to the rest of Canada, although a little bit slower. And so it now states that the it has to meet the requirements of payment legislation. The current CCDC to uh, 2008 um, doesn't address this. And so parts of the payment terms that are in those contracts, if you're still using them, would just be overridden by the payment regime found in the Construction Act. And so, um, you know, even though you think you have an arrangement in terms of how payment works and timing of payment, if it doesn't comply with uh, prompt payment, then um, the legislation will override your contract. So the new CCDC seems to adopt some of the high level principles from prompt payment, even if the legislation doesn't apply in, in your province. Um, there's a bit more of a shift of responsibility and a little bit more, maybe more risk to the owner. You know, as a litigator, I would often see a history of owners hiding behind their consultants. Oh, I really want to get back to you, but my consultant's on vacation. They're reviewing the pay app or looking at it. They're reconciling, et cetera, et cetera. And this would really delay payment and decision on payments. And this just isn't allowed under this new CCDC uh, 2020 version. Uh, all the pay apps go um, to the consultant and the owner and the owner needs to deal with that pay application. Now, maybe you're thinking, hey, you're talking about this prompt payment. What is it? What are you talking about? I'm going to give you a very, very quick overview of how it works in Ontario. Um, everything starts with a proper invoice when the contractor gives an invoice to the owner um, and everything flows from this, the timing of payments, 28 days from the owner to pay the contractor. And when I use the word contractor, that's anyone that has a contract directly with the owner. So I know a lot of consultants, if you're sitting there, you think, I, hey, Farron, I'm not a contractor, I'm a consultant. But, you know, under the definitions, like Chris has said, it's really important to look at those definitions because under the definition of the act, um, if you have a contract directly with owner, you are a contractor. So the owner has 28 days to pay and then the contractor has seven days and we're talking calendar days, not business days to pay any of its subs. The um, 
Owner has 14 days to tell the contractor if they aren't going to pay them and why. Again, 14 calendar days. And there's a whole adjudication regime that we could talk to you about forever, but um, we're not going to go there this Friday. I know you probably want to get your weekend um, um, or at least to lunch. Um, it's been already along for me. Um, so we're going to skip over that. But again, that's part of this process. The owner needs to notify the contractor. Um, um, of the issue of the pay app and it's not the consultant. The owner needs to pay within 28 days um, of compliance within the pay, um, the payment legislation. Um, a big difference between the Construction Act in Ontario and uh, the CCDC 2 2020 is that um, it had, the contract has mandated the need for stat deck and WSIB certificate, which is a no brainer for us. I know no one's like shocked by this, but it actually isn't in the Construction Act. And technically, um, if you're going off the CCDC 2 2008 version and you haven't updated it, um, and just the terms of the legislation apply, there is no need for the contractor to give a stat deck or SIB, which leads to all sorts of problems. But that isn't the case with the CCDC 2 2020. Um, and I just would add that a lot of payment terms um, will likely be modified by the owner. So I know Jeff's going to talk about this a little bit later. He's been making tons of changes to payment um, terms and, you know, something to look at and think about is what goes into a proper invoice and modified paid when paid clauses, et cetera. So, you know, this is a step forward, but it probably isn't quite there. It isn't a home run in terms of what you you would probably want in your contract for payment terms. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, so the new CCDC2 did make a subtle change to uh, the safety provisions, um, but it is it is an important one. So the old CCDC2 2008 had this provision in it, which essentially stated that if the owner brought other contractors onto the site, the owner became responsible for health and safety on site, essentially. Um, now, this clause frequently caused problems. Um, it was often deleted or amended by supplementary conditions because the owner... Uh, very often would bring another contractor onto the project, you know, often to perform some sort of discrete task like supplying furniture, installing audiovisual equipment, maybe a landscaper. Um, and, and in that case, it didn't really make sense for the owner to suddenly be placed in the position under the under the contract of being responsible for health and safety on site. Um, and, and, you know, the general contractor is obviously, they're t typically the, the parties um, are in agreement that it's the general contractor who's obviously in the best position um, to be responsible for health and safety on site and to be fulfilling the roles of, of the constructor under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, so it looks like the CCDC kind of recognized this and deleted that provision um, and made a few other slight changes to the safety terms. Um, and as a result, the safety provisions on, under the CCDC2 are now a little more straightforward and they really do, I think, reflect the reality of most construction projects. Um, so the rules now under the new CCDC2 is essentially that the contractor is responsible for overall health and safety on the project, even if the owner brings on other contractors onto the site. Um, however, both parties must comply with health and safety legislation, including the owner, right? That's a contractual requirement. And the owner must ensure that any of these other contractors that it brings onto the site comply with the contractor's health and safety precautions. Uh, so again, I think these changes make sense and they really do kind of reflect the reality of uh, construction projects. Um, with that said, the last point I'll just make though quickly is that um, it, it does remain important, I think, for owners to ensure that they are including language in their agreements with any of these other contractors performing any sort of, you know, little scope of work on the project um, because they want language in there that, that makes, that, that has them acknowledging that the general contractor is in fact responsible for health and safety on the site. And I think as, as contractors, um, it, it would be good to encourage owners to, to get that language in there because I think it just helps everybody on the project be on the same page. Um, so that, that's it for safety. And now let's move on to one of the most significant changes in the new CCDC2, which is ready for takeover. Krista. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, so ready for takeover, we hear people say to us, what is ready for takeover? What's this new thing um, in the CCDC? So, Ready for takeover, it's now a concept that runs through the whole document. And for the most part, what it's doing is replacing in the CCDC2 um, substantial performance of the work. So instead of that phrase, instead of that as a milestone, 
ready for takeover um, is now the, the, the new phrase. And part of the reason for this, and um, it's, a, it's a good change in my view, is it addresses sort of the, the, the mismatch between um, substantial performance under the contract, the CCDC2 contract, um, as compared to substantial performance under the Construction Act. And so now we have a different phrase um, ready for takeover, which is in the contractual document, um, which sort of addresses that, that misalignment of, uh, of words or phrases um, or confusion, I guess, in some respect. So what is ready for takeover? What are the prerequisites or the requirements for ready for takeover? Um, those in um, the agreement itself, and they're at general condition 12.1.1. So if you think back of when I talked about the, what's in the CCD, the, the CCDC2 and where it is, these are that, that third piece that I spoke about the, the general condition, follow the A pages and the, and the definitions. So in 12.1.1, um, the requirements for ready for takeover um, are set out. And you'll see some of them we've marked here with a star, a little asterisk. And that's because those are part of ready for takeover or requirement or prerequisite for ready for takeover if and as they're required by the contract documents. So um, you'll have to look at other documents to, to see whether these particular items that are marked with the star are required. So there are the, the, um, the eight items. Number one, um, the consultant um, needs to have certified or verified substantial performance. So that will be required. And then you'll need to have compliance with any um, authorization having jurisdiction. That's um, what AHJ is an acronym for, uh, um, authority having jurisdiction um, for occupancy um, of, the, of the project. So, you know, that's your, your municipality most, most likely. If your contract documents require it, as the site been cleaned up, waste remo removal, um, operating and maintenance documents, um, if they're required by the, the contract, sometimes, I mean, this is something we see as sort of the, the piece that for some reason, it's, the, it's the, the last piece that is hard to drag across the finish line. So make sure that those documents are available, check the contract to make sure um, they're ready. Um, as built drawings being available, um, on site. <clears throat> I always wonder what on site means since they're electronic on site where. Anyway, um, just my own uh, thought. Um, startup testing um, required for immediate occupancy. Um, that's again, if the contract requires, requires that to be done. And of course, the contract can have not just those for that that phrase startup testing required or these other things here, but specifics of what's required, and that's why we say as slash if um, because there could be more specifics in the contract. The owner has been provided ability to secure access to the work. Um, I think that's a lawyer's way of saying does does owner have the keys. Um, or the swipe card or whatever it is. And then, and then demonstration and training. So that's sort of what's required. What is ready for takeover? It's once you've reached all of these, um, or sort of jumped all of these hurdles, contractor. Once these things are all done, then, um, you've hit the milestone, um, ready for takeover. So along with ready for takeover comes the idea of, of early occupancy. So in some instances, um, if the entire project is not ready for takeover, um, an owner may still be able to occupy part of the project, part of the work um, before ready for takeover. And there's two preconditions to that. One, of course, I'll do the second one first. You can't do anything unless the authorities tell you you can. So. You have to have prior approval from the authority having jurisdiction. Um, you can't go off on a lark of your own. And then the second issue is the contractor has to agree 
um, to the early occupancy. But when the contractor's deciding whether to agree, they have to be reasonable about that decision. So is it reasonable in the circumstance to grant this um, early occupancy? Um, the contractor doesn't have to worry about being reasonable if the authorities are like, no, 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 don't go in. Um, so those are the two preconditions. So then what happens if there is early occupancy? What happens from um, a practical perspective? Well, if the owner um, occupies part of the work, then that particular piece is deemed to have achieved ready for takeover. Um, and then care of that part passes to the owner from the contractor. Um, and so I'm just going to stop there before we get into the warranty bullet. I know you're all reading ahead. Don't read. Stop. I'm going to do the first two bullets first. Um, just as a practical matter, um, care of the work um, that, you know, that may be possible. But keep in mind, there's some instances where, for example, let's say um, the landscaping's not done, but people want to or the owner wants to occupy occupy the first floor and anyone going in there has to walk through um, a site that isn't ready for takeover um, to get to that part of the work that is able to be occupied. Now, maybe the authorities will say, eh, no, that seems like a bad idea and not give you approval in that situation. But you have to give some thought to what is being taken over and whether or not um, it's it's achievable to have that piece pass or the care of that piece pass to the owner. Um, and and then also the part that is that is um, given early occupancy is deemed to achieve um, ready for takeover that that piece. So so kind of give some thought to that before you say this is simple. You know, I've thought about some simple examples where there's a building and a parking garage and the parking garage lags, but the building's ready. Those are simple ones, but part of a building, the West Wing, I'll say, or, um, you know, certain floors, that becomes a little bit more difficult. And I'd say that difficult that difficulty is compounded a little bit by the fact that the warranty period on the occupied part starts at ready for at starts at ready for sorry starts at early occupancy. And so, um, when you're talking about warranties in an entire project, and I think about this a lot in terms of we want access to the ground floor while you're building, you know, the ground floor re retail while you're building uh, the units above. Um, some of the warranted issues or warranted parts of the building um, may be interconnected. And so you have to give some thought to how does the warranty work practically um, if the owner is taking early occupancy um, of a part of the part of the project. Um, so those are um, things to think about. No answers for me, just issues raised. And now I will uh, pass it over to Farron for indemnification and waiver. Okay, good. I thought you were going to pass it over to me to answer those questions. And that was I should great. have. Darn it. Next time. So, so thanks for that. And uh, glad I'll wait to see. I'll, I'll direct, make sure Andy directs all questions to you. So the, the next and probably less sexy in terms of a new concept is indemnification and waiver. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe these are things you kind of gloss over, but, you know, as a litigator, these are critical to future claims and issues. It's really, 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 really important to understand the changes and how they can impact the project. You know, hopefully they don't, but if they do, you definitely want to mitigate risk with these terms. Um, timing is now tied to ready for takeover instead of substantial performance, which makes sense for all of the reasons Krista sort of explained for ready for takeover and also sort of more tied to the dates of warranties. You know, it just sort of makes practical sense. Uh, there are limits on the types of indemnification. It's direct loss and damages. Um, and uh, the liability um, for indirect, consequential, punitive, and exemplary damages are excluded. Uh, you know, examples of consequential loss um, could be loss of profits, loss of goodwill, um, those kinds of things. But, um, and I hate to be a lawyer on this one, um, it, the law isn't entirely clear um, exactly what those losses are. So you know, our recommendation is always like, let's just make it clear so everyone knows what it is going in. So 
put it in your supplementary conditions exactly what kind of losses are um, excluded as opposed to just using um, indirect consultal losses. Because if you're trying to resolve things on a project without a lawyer, uh, you won't know. And even if you call your lawyer, they're probably going to argue with the other side. So again, try to make that clear in your supplementary conditions. Uh, there's also the need to indemnify third parties, claims without without limit, and there are the monetary caps on um, indemnity claims do remain. So again, uh, always important. One of the first places I always look when I'm reviewing a contract or a claim is these indemnity indemnification uh, section. So you should also pay a lot of attention to them. Over to you, Jamie, insurance, the real important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm here to talk about everybody's favorite topic for Friday afternoon, uh, insurance, specifically section 11 of the general conditions of the CCDC2. And that section refers to the CCDC41 publication, which is the insurance requirements publication as issued by the, the CCDC committee. Um, so I just wanna start by making it really, really clear. The CCDC 41 document is referenced in both the 2008 and the 2020 CCDC 2 contracts. And what it specifically states, it refers to the most recently published CCDC 41 document at the time of bid closing. So there's a bit of a misconception in the industry right now. Um, and we're seeing this from owners, consultants, and contractors. Whether you are signing a CCDC 2 2008 or a new one 2020 version, these changes that I'm going to be talking about specifically with regards to limits and new coverages requirements are actual contractual requirements today. Okay. Further to that, there is even a clause in section 11 that states that an owner via change order can ask you for mid-contract proof of the increased insurance requirements. So someone could come to you with a contract that you've been working on for a year, the owner, and ask you for proof of these coverages today. Um, so this is a contractual requirement across the board for all contractors signing CCDC2 contracts. So the first major change is that all insurance requirements have been changed to make reference to the ready for takeover milestone. Um, no shock there, that's a consistent theme, theme throughout the document. Um, where this the impacts is on the builder's risk or course of construction coverages that is required under all CCDC2 contracts. The co coverages are required to remain in place until achievement of the ready for takeover milestone plus an additional 10 days. There are some additional conditions in there, but that's the, gonna apply to the majority of contracts, okay? So that's the key thing. And I wanna make it really clear because we do see this miss by contractors. It doesn't matter if you're signing a $200,000 contract, a $2 million contract, or a $200, $200 million contract, you are required as prime contractor under CCDC2 to carry the builder's risk or course of construction coverages. Okay, second point, increased insurance limits. And this is where there's a bit of pain in the industry right now. Um, so for general liability, automobile liability, and manned aircraft and watercraft liability insurance coverages, the new requirement has been increased from $5 million per occurrence to $10 million per occurrence. On the general liability, the deductible is not to exceed $10,000. In addition, there is a new unmanned aerial vehicle liability insurance requirement for $5 million. This one has been specifically written in to address the increased usage of drones on construction sites. And you may be sitting there thinking right now, well, I don't use drones on my site, so this doesn't apply. And in theory, you are correct. This only applies when, or is only required when a drone is going to be used directly or indirectly in the performance of the work. However, as prime contractors, it is your responsibility to ensure that your trades are not using drones on site as well, right? So what could happen? If you say, well, I'm not gonna carry this coverage because we don't have a drone, and then your foreman contractor shows up and has a drone on site and causes an incident, right? You're gonna be pulled into any lawsuits and you will not have any coverages, and more likely than not, your general liability policy will not step up and, and cover any drone-related losses. So our recommendation here is that you either are purchasing this coverage and just carrying it in a blanket uh, format, or for all contracts at your initial site visit, having conversations with all subtrades and making it clear that drones should not be on the contract site. And then there's a new contractor's pollution insurance requirement as well. Um, at the $5 million limit. 
We have seen this one written in more and more frequently under supplementary conditions. However, this is now a blanket requirement of the new CCDC 41, which was recently published in, in December of 2020 at the $5 million limit. So this is another coverage the majority of contractors are going to need to carry. We just jump slides there, Farron. So what does this all mean from a real world impact? Well, unfortunately, um, I'm sure many of you have gone through an insurance purchase, let's say in the last six to 12 months, and are, are well aware that the insurance market is what we in what we consider to be a hard market, which means rates are increasing and in certain situations, coverages are decreasing. So you're already facing increased costs related to insurance coverages, and now you need to increase limits and coverages as well. We estimate that probably 70 to 80% of, of contractors, general contractors are carrying the $5 million limit right now, as that has been the requirement dating back to 2008. If you're working for the federal government or specific owners, uh, or if you're a larger contractor, you may already carry the $10 million limit, uh, but the majority would not be carrying that limit. So there's gonna be increased coverages there, um, increased limit requirements and increased costs associated with that. In addition, there's the pollution coverage, which many are carrying, and it does not matter if you're doing new building construction, interior renovations, any, any type of CCDC construction um, under a CCDC2 contract is, is going to require that pollution coverage as well. So increased costs across the board, unfortunately, I'm the bearer of bad news today. Um, in addition, we do expect that, that these requirements are going to become the new normal across the industry. So it doesn't really matter if you're signing a CCDC2 contract or not. Um, as we saw in 2008, the last version of the CCDC41 was updated where limit li or liability limits increased from two to five million. We expect the increase from five to 10 will become the new standard across the industry and not just at the prime contractor level, um, we like this is going to flow down through the construction pyramid because it is considered best practice to request the same limits uh, from your sub trades. And that's often driven by the by the insurance markets as well as a requirement. Um, so on a positive note, I don't want to leave it all off with uh, with bad news. Um, the reason these increased limits and coverages have been added in here is simply because as Canada becomes a more litigious society, we are seeing more and more lawsuits and settlements coming in above the $5 million threshold. And so while there are increased costs here, um, this has been written in this format to add protection for, for all contractors and protect your, your balance sheets and, and your assets and livelihoods. So uh, on that note, I will pass it back to Krista. Thank you, uh, Jamie. I'm going to just outline a few other changes. And I think when I was speaking before, I may have droned on a little bit past my allotted time. So I'll do this more quickly. If you saw anyone's face being like, it's because I might have been going past my time. All right. So quickly, um, there's a few other changes. And one um, change to bring your attention, attention to is the review of contract documents. Um, so the contractor's obligation to review contract documents has uh, changed. And now it says that that review is only for the purposes of, and this is the quote here, facilitating coordination and execution of the work. Um, and that's um, a, a change from um, the, the previous review, which was best knowledge, information, and belief. And of course, um, that, that particular previous uh, general condition was frequently changed in supplementary conditions anyway. So uh, generally speaking, I would say if something gets changed in every contract, maybe it should uh, be reconsidered. So that's what's, um, what's happened here. Um, and then a few other changes. Um, sort of high level, we're not gonna uh, get into these in detail, but just so you have a sense that they're there and you can um, take a look at these sections. Um, I'm gonna start with the, with the last one, which is the cash allowances. That's been changed now so that um, all cash allowances get, get pooled. Um, so there's a reallocation of um, unexpended cash allowances um, so that they're pooled together. Um, 
adjudication, this goes with um, the prompt payment and the prompt payment legislation uh, that Farron spoke about earlier um, this morning. Um, and so adjudication is part of that and uh, part of the, the prompt payment regime. And so it's been added in to reflect that. Adjudication doesn't uh, replace a dispute resolution process or even court. It's in addition um, to those processes. Um, delays, um, delay by a stop work order entitles contractor to a time extension, um, but only if the stipulated ready for takeover date cannot be achieved. So you can look at that in 6.5.1 and then change directives um, as well. Um, you can no longer charge for wages of personnel engaged in reviewing um, drawings, processing the changes, um, that sort of thing. And that's in 6.3. So those are sort of a few smaller, um, smaller changes. All right, Farron. Over, over to, to Division you. 1. So um, Division 1, you know, it's not, it's not being talked about as much as ready for takeover and some of the other changes, but really important for you, everyone, to understand um, if Division 1 is being used, what it's being used for, um, it's an option, and there's a couple of things you want to think about. So, you, one, you don't have to use it, um, but if you are using it, you need to pay attention, and if you aren't using it, you're going to have to pay attention. Um, so, really, you have to <laughs> just pay attention. Um, but there were things that were from the CCDC2 2008 general conditions that were moved to Division 1. Um, as part of the ramp, and that includes things like cutting and patching. So while you might sort of just assume you don't you don't want to use Division One, I'm working with the CCDC two. I'm familiar with it. There are things from the general conditions that were moved to Division One, and if you want to keep them in, you're going to want to take them from Division One or from and put them in supplementary conditions if you aren't using Division One. Um, if you are going to use it, um, one of the key things you want to make sure you do is one, include it in the list of documents um, that form part of the contract because it isn't automatically there. Um, and, uh, you know, you want to make sure that everyone knows Division One is part of the contract. Uh, another thing you want to think about um, when you're dealing with Division One is it's a Word document to be edited. And it's really something that a lot of consultants will be working on and may need to work on in collaboration with your lawyers or your contract manager or whoever. So one, you have to work with your consultants closely. And the other thing is it's sort of a blank slate. It's a, a free uh, document for someone to enter into information into. So, you know, you really have to review everything really carefully. Um, one, if it's your document or two, if you're entering into an agreement, it's not as easy as looking at the supplementary conditions and seeing where a typical form has been modified. So you're going to want to look out and really read those Division I terms uh, carefully to make sure you know what's in there. Um, and, uh, you know, see if it, it works for you. So over to uh, Jeff to talk about supplementary conditions. As I just said, I think they're still needed. But Jeff, was I right or wrong? Unfortunately, you were right. So yes, the, the dreaded supplementary conditions. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them, and we've mentioned already in the presentation. Um, and, you know, as you've already seen, the updated CCDC2 2020 um, did resolve some issues that were frequently modified by supplementary conditions, um, like that problematic safety provision I mentioned earlier. Um, but the reality is that supplementary conditions will still very much be used by owners in the construction industry. Um, so it's important to be aware of them, you know, as contractors, and, and it's important to uh, understand how to best navigate some common issues that arise with them and generally how to navigate. Them. I mean, supplementary conditions every year, they seem to get larger and larger and larger. And now it's not, it's not uncommon to see supplementary conditions that are over 50 pages. Um, so, you know, it, it's, they, they will remain, unfortunately, uh, I think in a lot of people's view, a, um, a critical document that forms part of the contract. Um, and so you can see a list of items here on screen that are some of the some of the issues that owners will still likely be adding to their contracts by supplementary conditions. So uh, things like specific um, invoice submission and review procedures, um, clauses that it, uh, impose an obligation on the contractor to remove construction liens from title, 
you know, liquidated damages in some cases, um, expanded indemnity obligations. Um, you know, obviously COVID was something that was, that was being addressed, um, you, you know, since it, since the pandemic started essentially in Ontario, it was, you know, additional provisions were being added in supplementary conditions to uh, spell out exactly what entitlement or relief in terms of schedule um, or additional costs was, was uh, allowed for, if any. Um, and and as, as well as other new legislative developments, such as the new uh, regulation that was just introduced at the beginning of this year, dealing with management of excess soil. Um, so there's still a host of things uh, that I think you're still owners are still going to want to uh, include as part of the contract. And that's why you're um, probably going to see supplementary conditions certainly sticking around for the near future. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're, we're just going to talk about some of the um, common mistakes that uh that that we we frequently see um and some of these are while they are common and, and the uh, repercussions can be fairly significant a lot of them are easy to avoid so one is failing to describe contract documents properly in the ccdc um this is again this is a mistake that can have huge implications but it's something that can be easily avoided with just a little upfront work uh so you know it's really important to ensure that the list of contract documents is accurately described right all the specifications drawings and any other documents that are supposed to form part of your agreement, right? Maybe your bid submission, your proposal. Um, it's really important to make sure they're accurately titled. Um, and so that, the, you know, when a third party is reviewing that section, and in CDC2, this is, we're talking about Article A3, um, when a third party reviews that, there's no um, confusion around what documents are being referred to and what documents form part of the contract. Um, and so, you know, if there's if uh, it's similarly, you don't want to include a document in there that it shouldn't form, form part of the contract, like a, you know, a, um, a, an old draft of a construction schedule, for example. Um, another mistake that is uh, we frequently see is is contractors not flowing down the key risks and obligations in the prime contract into their contracts. Right. So, again, we're seeing a lot of changes made to the CCDC prime contract in supplementary conditions that can have significant impacts on your rights and entitlements and obligations as a contractor. And so you want to make sure that that's all properly getting down into your subcontracts. Um, also, accepting in, improper risk for the type of project that you're bidding on, right? So this could be something like a clause in the supplementary conditions that states that you as the contractor acknowledge that you performed a site investigation and that you're assuming the risk of all site conditions that could have been discovered during that investigation. Um, you know, if you weren't actually given an opportunity to perform a site investigation, that clause isn't appropriate. And so, you know, that may have just some old boilerplate clause the owner had from another, from another con from another project. So th that's that's another type of clause you want to, you know, consider as certainly at the bidding stage and at the contract negotiation stage. Um, similarly, we often see contractors unwittingly adding unlimited liability in some in some areas of the contract. So um, the, we see this commonly with the indemnity provisions. So the CCDC, um, as Farron mentioned, has these indemnification provisions in the new 2020 document. They're in GC 3.1, so right near the end of the contract. Um, and they're frequently expanded and modified in supplementary conditions by owners. Um, and so, you know, they, they'll often be expanded to include other third parties. So you have to indemnify, you know, the consultant or you know, the owner's under or the tenant or the landlord, some parties may not even uh, know who they are, right? So th this is, again, a clause you want to zero in on and see exactly is it, you know, is what the change being made? How is that going to impact the risk profile of this contract I'm bidding on? Um, lastly, failing to comply with contract notice requirements. Um, if, you've prob if you've been to any presentation by a construction lawyer, you've probably heard this before, but uh, it's very important to comply with the contract notice requirements, right? This CCDC2 already has some, like providing notice of delay within 10 days, but it's, it's something supplementary conditions will often, you know, um, uh, expand upon. They'll include additional um, notice requirements and they may even shorten the, the, the timelines in the, in the standard form. So it's important to take stock of all that so that you're aware of them and that you can ensure that your subcontractors are bound by them as well. Um, so now with that said, let's let's move on to finish off with some best practices um, in light of some of those some of those common mistakes. Um, so first, you know, obviously review the proposed form of contract, right? It, now, if it's a tender, the proposed form of contract should be 
uh, attached. They're also commonly attached in RFPs now as well. And you just want to make sure it's get you you review it. You review the sensory conditions carefully. Um, again, there can be some fairly discreet and innocuous looking clauses buried away in there that have real implications on price, right? Um, and so you, you also want to figure out whether the contract terms are up for negotiation. Um, even if the terms of the contract aren't up for negotiation, so the owner's just saying, you know, th this is the form of contract you're bidding on. Here are the supplementary conditions. Take it or leave it. You, you can't object to any of them. Uh, you still want them reviewed, right? You still want to know what you're getting into. Um, and, you know, equally importantly, you want to make sure that any of the key risks and obligations um, get carried down into your subcontracts as well. Um, the insurance terms in a CCDC document are also frequently modified by supplementary conditions. Um, so and send those off to your broker ASAP, right? As soon as you get the proposed form of contract, um, send them off so they can get reviewed and they can let you know if there's any concerns. Um, and again, learn to spot those red, you know, those key red flag clauses, um, which we mentioned before. Uh, and secondly, ensure that you have a very good form of subcontract, right? Um, as contractors in this market, you, you often find yourself without a lot of bargaining power, right? The, the owner is often the one dictating the term, uh, the, the form of the contract. Um, and so as a result of that, a key avenue for contractors to mitigate and manage the risk is in their subcontracts. So you want to make sure your subcontracts are proper, properly drafted, they're, they're updated to you know, reflect any key risks in the, the prime contract that, you're, that you just got awarded. Um, and now some subcontracts like the, um, the standard form CCA1, which is widely used in, in Ontario, um, will, will have an incorporation by reference clause. So this is a this is a clause that essentially refers to the prime contract, so your CCDC contract with the owner, um, and incorporates it by reference. It pulls it down and makes it part of the subcontract. And that's certainly helpful, um, but that's often not enough. It, it's now becoming uh, common to see in supplementary conditions um, requirements uh, that the contractor actually expressly include specific clauses in their subcontract or have their subcontractor acknowledge or agree to specific terms and conditions. Um, so it's important that you actually get those clauses carried down into your subcontract. Um, also, you know, think about the fact that if the owner has made changes to your entitlement to things like costs uh, or time extension for delays in the prime contract in your CCDs through supplementary conditions, you want to make sure your subcontract terms reflect those in the same way, right? Otherwise, you know, for example, you could be in a situation where a subcontractor of yours ends up being entitled to a greater time extension or greater cost lay than you're entitled to under your CCDC2 contract with the owner. Um, also, if the prime contract has a termination for convenience clause, for example, which is um, another very important clause and something that's very often included in supplementary conditions, as the contractor, again, you want to make sure that your subcontracts contain a similar clause so that you can similarly terminate your subcontracts for convenience if this were to ever happen so that you don't find yourself shackled to the subcontracts that you can't get out of if you've been terminated for convenience. Um, and, you know, consider your obligations in your subcontracts and whether they're, you know, any of them sh should be changed. So, you know, take a look through your standard form uh, subcontracts. Um, the CCA1 subcontract, as I mentioned, it's, it's commonly used. It, it does read well with the CDC2. Um, so it's a good subcontract. Um, but it does, in some cases, have fairly onerous obligations on the contractor. Um, you know, for example, it, there's, it requires the contractor to take some pretty drastic steps in the event the owner hasn't paid the contract. So it, it's those types of terms you want to revisit and consider whether you actually want to be bound by those obligations. Um, and you also want to consider them in light of the uh, new prompt payment and adjudication rules in, in, uh, under the Construction Act in Ontario. Um, lastly, know when to get advice, right? It, you know, we all appreciate that projects are busy. You're focused on getting your bid and your proposal accepted um, and, and then getting the job done and preserving your relationship with your owner clients. Um, but we can certainly tell you from experience that, you know, we often see clients come to us where they're knee deep in a problem or a dispute that relates to some issue or clause in their contract. And very often in those cases, it could have been avoided if the issue was addressed up front or at least um, had been on the contractor's radar when it was bidding or negotiating that contract. So, you know, the time for reviewing your contract, reviewing the supplementary conditions, ensuring you have the requisite insurance requirements, 
uh, getting your subcontracts in order. The time for doing that is early on, right? It's not after the fact, once you've been awarded the job or if you're well into construction. So uh, time really does make a huge difference in construction, as all of you know. Um, and this is no different, right? So the, the more proactive you can be um, with, you know, negotiating, reviewing and preparing your contract documents, the better. Um, so that about does it. Um, and I think I'll uh, turn it over to Andrew for some uh, closing remarks and time for any questions if we do have time, which I think we do. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, pretty amazing that a group of lawyers and insurance executives are just talking a little early. So we do have some time for questions, which is great. Um, thank you, Jeff, and then Jamie, Krista, and Farron for the great insights here. Uh, so the first question I'll just kick it off with is, is really more of a general question, but uh, in the era now of more digital contracts, what risks and controls should contractors really be aware of in, in signing digital contracts in the age of COVID? Well, I can I can I take a stab at that. Um, there, I guess there's a few things to consider. So one is um, the it, it depends. Certainly, it depends what province you're in. The, the laws in different jurisdictions are different in terms of what you know what the requirements are for signing a contract. But for the most part, um, you know you can electrically you know put an electric signature on a contract, and that's it's going to be binding just like if you signed it. Um, in writing, uh, but what, what's often what we often do, just to, to be clear and just to be safe, is to include a clause that actually just allows you to do that. That just says, you know, it's just two sentences that basically says, um, you know, you can you can uh, you can sign the contract electronically, and we can both sign a different copy of the contract, and that's you know that's fine. We can exchange uh, documents, and it's it's still the same contract, just like we executed it in person. But I, I think the thing just to keep in mind is really, it comes back to the contract documents. So if you are circulating you know, to the owner, for example, or the consultant circulating to the contractor and the owner, a copy of the, the CCDC to get signed, you really wanna make sure, again, go back and look at the uh, article A3, the list of contract documents in the CCDC2, um, because that if there's any confusion, th this is where there could be a problem, right? Um, so what what a best practice we often recommend is when you're listing documents in the uh, contract documents field is to actually just list um, list them by appendix, right? Appendix A, you know, the drawing and specification list. Appendix B, the geotechnical report. Appendix C, supplementary conditions. And then when you circulate the CCDC contract for execution, you know, maybe upload all those appendixes on onto a you know a SharePoint site or a document management site. And include a link in in the email to be very clear like you know appendixes a through g are all attached here um you know are, are all found at this at this sharepoint site so there's absolutely no confusion because i think that's that's really the bigger risk with executing contracts electronically is that there's confusion around what all the other contracts are because they're very often too big to be you know sent or included as part of this part of the same email so that was probably way too long an answer for such a simple question. But, no, it's uh, perfect. It's perfect. We have a couple more though. So John's got a question, and thanks, John, for this question. But uh, he first remarked how depressing it is to be a GC, and uh, can't say I disagree with you, John. But uh, can anyone on the panel outline the positive elements of the new CCDC contract for a GC and its trades, if there in fact are any? Well, I'm ready for takeover, like the concept, like just changing the, the terms and clarifying the concept is really a great thing for everybody because it avoids some confusion. Um, so that's really a good, um, a good change. And then, uh, you know, the other thing, and, and, you know, I think it's a bigger uh, conversation and debate about the prompt payment legislation um, in Ontario and, and, and the other provinces that have adopted it. But I think it, the, the idea that that legislation has now been at least acknowledged in the, in the CCDC too should, in theory, um, socialize that legislation, I will say, because at some point I would like to think that what will happen in the industry is that owners will become socialized to the fact that this is the timeline um, in which payments should be made. And every time that gets acknowledged in anything, um, I think that we're moving closer to that point where that's 
where the owner's mindset is. So it's not sort of an instant win or an instant hooray, um, the, the legislation's there, but I think sort of long-term, it's important for things like this to get brought into standard construction documents. I would also just add, I think the, the changes to the indemnity section are in the contractor's favor for the most part. Um, I mean, Farron made a really good point that the Canadian law on what constitutes consequential damages, it's kind of, it's kind of a mess, but the fact that now, and again, this is just for the CCDC too. It's not in the, you know, the 5B or the 14, the, the other CCDC contracts yet. Um, but the indemnity in the CCDC two now does it exclude um, the uh, obligation to indemnify for consensual damages, which I think is, and that wasn't in the old one. And I think for the most part, that's that's a win for contractors because it's more often, I think in our experience, that it's owners, if there's going to be a lawsuit over consequential damages, you know, it's it's owners suing the contractor for lost revenue, you know, because our grocery store wasn't open or lost rent because the, the apartment building was late. It's it's rarer that the contractor is the one who's asking for indemnity for consequential damages. So I think that's a that's a, actually a big win for contractors. Actually, now that I think a review of contract documents, too, is good for contractors. It's all good for contractors. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Krista, Jeff. Uh, Jamie, this one's for you and I think a bit more of a clarification, but um, if you sign a CCDC2 2008 contract versus a CCDC2020, can you avoid the new insurance requirements? And you covered that a little bit, but maybe touch on it again. So, I mean, in theory, you, you can avoid it. And in practicality, a lot of contractors are not carrying the higher limits and additional coverages. Uh, but from a practical contractual standpoint, the increased requirements um, do apply to the 2008 contract. Uh, and as I said earlier, it's based on, it refers to the CCDC 41 that was most recently published at the time of closing. So that's the easiest way to think of it. If you're signing a CCDC 2 2008 version today, it does refer to the new coverages and higher limits. Perfect, thanks Jamie. Last question, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, if there's a disagreement on early occupancy between an owner and a contractor, is that something that can be settled through the adjudication process? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't think that is in the list of um, items that can be adjudicated. Farron, do you know off the top of your head? It's not on the list. It's anything the parties can agree to. Um, and then the dispute resolution, it's anything the parties agree to be within the adjudication framework. So it's not uh, explicit in the legislation, but might be something parties want to think about and might agree to even if it isn't in the contract. Yeah, because it's actually a great thing to adjudicate, um, but it's not contemplated by the legislation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, Kristen and Farron. I see Giovanni there. So just uh, as last closing remarks, just really want to thank the presenters for a great session. I want to thank the OGCA for all the, the great symposiums they put on today. I know in a, a very tough environment to do something like this, and it's really important to get together and talk about important topics and changes within our industry. And lastly, just want to thank the sponsors for stepping up and, and supporting again in, in, a, in a tough environment these days. So, so thanks, and, and Giovanni, take it away. Uh, thank you all. Um, again, from the top down, Andrew, Jamie, Krista, Farron, and Jeff, you guys were uh, riveting. And I'm going to say this to all the attendees watching. Um, if you have any questions, you've got resources. Uh, we're forwards and other uh, APP legal counsels that we have. Uh, ask ask a lawyer. I think that's, that, that's what this should have been titled. Just ask a lawyer. If you have any questions, by all means, they, they're they happy to assist, as you can see, and they're... Uh, their knowledge, it just, it, it's mind boggling at times. Uh, with that being said, I just want to uh, advise you that uh, the next session will be at one o'clock. That session will be uh, extinguishing the top five fires affecting contractor insurance prams in 2021. And it's presented by Petrella Winter and Associates and Royal Sun Alliance. Uh, Sun Alliance. Right now, I think I will direct everyone to, uh, uh, um, go into the lounge. Uh, apparently we're having a barbecue at some of the tables. So you should really join some of these tables. There's food being offered. I don't know uh, how tasty it's gonna be, but I offer it out to everyone. And with that being said, have a good break. We'll see you back at one o'clock.